to get interested in the things that are happening as well. Hello, everyone. I'm Subhashree Patra. Sorry about the delay. Um, today, I'm going to speak about memory compression using random access gates. This is a joint work with uh, Harry Gooman, Florian Spielman, and uh, so the camera is checking angles. <laughs> 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 so I come here and then you catch it. No, no, you should get Okay, this is. Uh, yeah, it's a joint work with Harry Kuhlman, Bruno Lauf, and uh, Florian Spellman. And uh, okay, this is a result that we got while working on some other problem actually. So it's uh, not a very big result, but it's a cute result. Uh, let me start. Okay. Now, uh, I don't know what's happening. Would you to select the app? Oh, it's fine. Can you try again? Okay. Yeah, okay. Okay. Yeah. Before I get into, uh, I'm going to explain everything that I said in this cycle, memory compression using random access gate. But uh, before I explain anything in that, I want to first uh, describe the computational model on which we will be looking uh, to compress things. And um, after that, I'll be talking about what are sparse algorithms in the computational model. And then I will be discussing some data structures. Uh, for people who are not familiar with quantum things here, don't worry. We have a lot of classical things going on in this. And uh, then we will combine everything to make this technique, this compression technique, using these data structures. And in the end, we will discuss some applications on how to, like, why this technique can be used and how it will be used. OK? Yeah. The model of computation for us is uh, one of the definitions of quantum random access machine model. And uh, it's a circuit model, which looks like this. So imagine we have these, uh, yeah, we have some work qubits on the top. Then we have some memory qubits on the bottom. Like these are all wires. Now we have a single qubit or double qubit unitaries on this work qubit. We have oracle access for the input on these work qubits. But whenever you want to access any of these memory qubits, you can only do by using something called a random access gate, which allows you to index into any of these memory qubits in one step of this gate. Okay? But implementing this gate is not going to be simple because it's going to require n order n uh, gates, like elementary gates. Uh, but the reason we can assume this is because in classical setting also, when we assume a random access machine model, we do a, a similar assumption. Like we can access any memory in one step. And this is what the assumption we are doing in the quantum world. Okay. Now, the, how the RAG gate looks like is something like this. It just takes this index i and another qubit b, and it will swap the xi at qubit with this b qubit. Okay. So once you use this RAG gate, what you're doing essentially is you are taking this particular i at qubit, you're swapping with some ancilla here, and then whatever operation you want to do, you do, and then you can swap it back. Okay. So this is this is how the computational model is. Okay. Now, what would the sparse algorithm in this computation model look like? So the uh, don't worry about the text, I'm going to explain everything. Now we saw this model. Q of um, random access model. Now we define a circuit here as a tuple. So imagine you have this input length as n. You have t, you have w, that is work qubits, and m memory qubits. And c1 to c t denote instructions that are applied on this uh, in the circuit. So it's like a, um, um, you can imagine a circuit could be a directed excitement graph. And you can imagine a topological ordering of these gates in the circuit. And for um, whenever you have, uh, um, yeah, and uh, I'm going to count every single gate as one operation in this model. 
Now, that we say some algorithm is M sparse if at any time step, the state of the algorithm is only supported by you know, states whose Hamming weight, like the Hamming weight of these states is bounded by some small M. Okay, this is what we define to be an M sparse algorithm. And we are going to now present techniques that can compress this. Now, if I have uh, my memory qubits as large M, and I know that my state is never going to have any, any memory state which is larger than uh, this small M, then maybe there are procedures to not use capital M qubits, but actually use smaller amount of qubits. So this is what we're going to discuss on how to compress these algorithms. And I will also show you that these kind of M sparse algorithms actually exist, like which like are very easy to uh, think of. So it's not something that we just made up on the go. Uh, I will I will give you evidence of this. Any questions till now? Yeah, but so what, do, can you tell us the equation why is this the good notion of sparseness? Okay. So in the classical setting also, like, so sometimes when we have these query algorithms mm -hmm. and we want to make them time efficient also, mm -hmm. we use interesting data structures to store uh, the input in such a way that, you know, you can access them efficiently. Mm -hmm. Now what happens, even in the classical setting, you can sometimes use very interesting data structures, but <coughs> for one algorithm, you're not going to use all the memory space, mm -hmm. okay? And we have some, like hashing techniques in the classical setting where you can compress those algorithms. So it is like very natural to think what we can do in the quantum setting in this case. And this is why we explored this. Yeah. Is there any restriction on W can be larger than a small M or whatever? Uh, usually W, w. is like log. Yeah, the size of the W is order log capital M. Okay. Uh, not not too much. And for uh, most of the algorithms that we look at, my the size of this M is going to be actually polynomial in little m, which is uh, the input size. So uh, W is not going to be more than order log M or polylog M, uh, M. Okay. So any other questions to now? No. Okay. Um, now we saw that in our sparse algorithms, we have our states on vectors whose Hamming weight was bounded by some small n, okay? Now, if I give you a task that we have some vector which has, you know, a lot of sparse, sparsity in it, that means it has a lot of zero entries and has like a few <coughs> entries. Now, instead of using this capital M memory size to denote that vector, obviously we would like to think of more succinct representations for that vector. Right? One simple way would be that, okay, don't, don't store the entire string, which is of M bit, but just store the indices that have that one. And when we have very few of these indices, then we might have like actually much lesser memory usage, right? So for example, when we have like, you know, um, this small M is actually less than M by log M itself, we already have an improvement because you can just use those bits to store this, okay? But now the challenge is, see, suppose I have this uh, uh, this uh, this set S V corresponding to this V, but I have to have a unique representation for S V, right? Because if I if I want to have a quantum state which is S V, which is like corresponding to V, and if any algorithm that works on that state V has to have something analogous. And if we want the amplitude and the interference to matter, then we want this SV also to have a unique representation, okay? But there will be some other restrictions that we will need because of the compression technique, which I will uh, slowly explore. Uh, so now uh, the broad idea is to represent this state V instead of this, uh, sorry, represent the state as SV instead of the state V, okay? But now another challenge is we have to ensure that every instruction, that every gate that I had applied in my original M sparse algorithm has an analogous implementation in my new compressed algorithm. Otherwise, I'm I'm not giving you a compressed algorithm. Anymore, right? so, so yeah, 
first thing that we need is that we need the representation to be unique. Then, oh, yeah, another thing. We also need the representation to be history independent. I will get to that. History independence is nothing but when you create a set S and um, uh, the data structure, you cannot different, like by looking at the ele like elements in the data structure, you should not be able to tell what was the last element added. So the data structure should be like, should mask out all the history information. And yeah, like I said, now for every instruction in this original algorithm, we would like that there is an efficient analogous operation C dash I in my new algorithm. Only then I will have a, a nice analogous parse algorithm. <coughs> and uh, to uh, to this like to to actually give this compression technique, we use a lot of data structures <coughs> as building blocks, which I will now slowly get into. Okay. Yeah. The first data structure that we're going to look at is something called a radix tree. Now, radix tree, like, uh, again, don't get boggled by the text here. I'm going to explain clearly. Now, radix tree is a, a rooted binary tree. And, uh, like, let me directly jump to the example here. So, yes, now look at this uh, set where we have these four elements that we want to store in this uh, data structure. We have uh, what we do is whenever you want to say create a radix tree pertaining to the set S, you first <coughs> find the, the longest prefix to all these strings. Okay. Whatever the longest prefix would be, suppose they don't have a common prefix, it was possible that they don't have a common prefix, then you bifurcate into the sets which have a common prefix and which do not. Like say in this case, we have. Uh, one string starting with zero and all the other strings start with one. So we clearly know that one of them has to be bifurcated by the other from the root node. Okay. So zero comes zero. But again, you repeat the process. Now you have uh, uh, these three strings and you have one here and then like you keep doing this. Okay. Now, so this, this, uh, uh, this data structure has some very interesting properties. Now, imagine you want to add a new element which is also of like four bits, right? The maximum like uh, checkings you're going to do is going to be of four bits. So if you are storing numbers from between one to some capital N, then at most you will be doing log n operations to store that index, to find the position of where that element has to go. Same thing is with deletion and same thing is also with lookup. And these are the three operations that we actually are going to care for. But now, what about the storage of this data structure? How do we store this data structure in the memory? So see, one thing is clear. For any set S, my radix tree corresponding to that set S is going to be unique. Because if, if, I, if I tell you that, OK, the first, the, the, right, uh, the left child has to be always with a 0, and the uh, right child always has to be with 1, then you can see that for any set S, I will always have a unique radix tree that represents that set S. But what is still not guaranteed is how is this radix tree going to be represented in the memory of my computer? Right? Ultimately, what is going to happen in the classical circuit is we care about the memory location on where these nodes and these cells go into. So we still have a challenge. We still don't have a unique memory representation of this radix tree on the computer. So then we uh, like explored on, on the literature of what exists here. And then we saw that, okay, now suppose you have this radix tree and you have M leaves on this radix tree, or you have the set S, which you know that is going to be at most M size. Then the radix tree will have at most M leaves because all the elements in the set has to be leaves in your radix tree. Now, because this is a binary tree, and it is, it need not be a complete binary tree, but it is a binary tree. So the total number of nodes that you will end up in this radix tree is going to be at most two n, right? Because you will have m leaves and, uh, like you know, two two can be paired for one parent and so on. But you're not going to have more than two m nodes. So you can represent this radix tree by an array of size two m blocks. Okay. Now, 
for every node here, what you will have, yeah, is two children at most and one parent. And by just that information and the label, uh, the, the, the value on this edges, the label on the edges, you can depict every node, okay? And so with the area of size 2M blocks, you can represent a radix tree. Now, uh, so you can think of this radix tree as a binary string of this quantity, which is just basically number of blocks and the size required for each block. Now what uh, uh, we, we could now think of the memory representation is, now you can imagine an injective function that takes any of these blocks of radix tree and puts it in one of these empty blocks in the array. Now that will be one particular memory representation for the radix tree, but there could be several. It's possible that, you know, uh, the root, no uh, and what I'm going to fix is just that the root node is always going to be at position one. Otherwise we will not know how to traverse the tree, right? Now the, uh, uh, like with, with more uh, exploration of literature, we stumbled upon something called quantum radix tree. And uh, this was in uh, uh, Stacy Jeffrey's PhD thesis. And uh, it was first introduced by Bernstein, Jeffrey, and Jen Morrow in 2013. And what the, the cool idea was, now, yes, it is a challenge to have a unique representation of the memory in, of the radix tree. So what we can instead do is, they have a superposition of all possible memory representation. So if you have this injective function, you just take a normalized state of all possible, uh, you know, this uh, injective representation of this radix tree. And, uh, uh, but it, it is still not done because how do, you, how do you do any of these data structure operations quickly if you have such a uniform superposition? And that is not very obvious. So for that, we had to then uh, think of something. Though it was answered in Stacy's uh, thesis, it wasn't completely clear. So we gave an alternate way of doing this, of how to efficiently <coughs> have a query, query of operations that are efficient on this quantum radix tree. But before I go that, we have to now talk about some other data structure operation that's called a prefix subtree which we extensively use. <coughs> okay. Now, this prefix sum tree is a little easier data structure. It is now a complete binary tree with each leaf node labeled by either 0 or 1. Okay. And uh, uh, what we are going to track is the number of leaf nodes that descend from any root. Okay. I will explain with a figure. So <coughs> okay. now suppose I want to store elements between 1 to n, right? Now one bad way of doing of storing this 1 to L element is have in my memory of the computer have specific locations you know reserved for element 1 to L. That is doable, right? And that would take a lot of memory like this L L uh, L size. Okay. Now, if, if you have an element, uh, say, say your set contains an element three, then you can toggle this bit to be one, okay? And then all its corresponding parents will have, uh, we will update the value of these counts by plus one. So what the root ends up containing in this tree is how many children I have, which are one. So that way I can efficiently, oh, thank you so much. Okay. I can efficiently do this lookup operation uh, in log n depth. See, otherwise, imagine I just had this array. I just had this array at the, the bottom, which uh, like whenever I had to insert an element, I just toggle that element to one. Now, the problem with that is I cannot find the kth one element. I, can't, I cannot find or say whether an element exists or not with, uh, sorry, with element exists or not, I can find quickly. But if I want to find the kth one element, I can't do it fast. But by having this prefix tree above it, I can have easy access. Because see, if the count is say 10, 
and I want to find the seventh one, then I don't have to go on this side. I will just go on this side. And every time I'm halving the space by every level. So in log n operations, I can do this lookup. I can do this insert because insert you just toggle this and uh, update all the parent nodes. Delete also you do the same thing, right? So using this prefix tree, uh, okay, let's recap the memory again. I know it's, uh, it's like a lot of data structures that we have done. What are we trying to do? We are trying to have a quantum radix tree, which is a radix tree over all possible memory allocations to that radix tree, right? It's a classical radix tree, but we are going to have all possible memory allocations. Now, we will now use this prefix tree as a tense, as a, another state with this quantum radix tree so that that can keep track of what are all the empty cells that are left. So whenever we want to insert something, we can actually traverse through the prefix tree, find an empty spot there, create a uniform superposition of all the empty spots, and then put the element there. That is, that is the idea here. And our injective map is going to be just the same injective map, but it is going to be a complement of, so basically we are going to have the set F as the set which contains the elements, uh, the spaces that are free instead of what are full. Okay. So to redefine this quantum radix tree, it is exactly the same. It is just that we have this radix tree, which is a classical data structure, and we have tensored it with this prefix tree that contains the value of all the cells that are empty. So that whenever I need to insert something by, I, I just have to insert it here by finding what are the free positions from this prefix tree. That is the idea of this point of that. But now how is that going to help? Now, okay, we discussed that any, any operation, any operations of our desire, that is insertion, deletion, or lookup, takes about order log m in the static tree. It takes about same order log m in this prefix tree also. So in this much time, we are able to actually insert anything we want in order log n because by linearity, we can make this argument. Right? So, so lookup look up operation is nothing but you want to know if there is an element in the set S and uh, the, the, uh, the, the thing like the unitary that I, we would like is it takes some element E, it takes our quantum radix tree, it takes another ancilla, and on the ancilla, it just toggles the bit if the element is present, and otherwise doesn't do anything if the element is not present. Now, this toggle operation, uh, now this is just a technical part to it. Like in classical computation, uh, we don't care about reversibility, right? So if I give you a state S and I say, okay, insert E to S, now, the classical operation is still going to go through even if E was already present in S. But we have to be careful here when we look at quantum ones because what happens, like what is insert operation in quantum setting? What if the E is already present? So we define another kind of operation just that is just toggle, which says if E is already present, then remove it. If E is not present, then add it. This is what the toggle operation does. Now the third operation that we want to implement is a swap operation. Now this is tailor-made to our requirement because what we want is, um, okay. Now we started all this thing as a process to compress these n sparse algorithms, okay. There were, and the RAD gates were the only gates that were actually accessing the wires from one to n. Everything else was only on the work units, right? So now, we, if I'm having a compressed algorithm and I'm saying that my new algorithm is not going to use that many wires, I need some operation equivalent to RAG, which I can do on this new algorithm. This is the swap operation that we actually use as like instead of this RAG operation. And interestingly, we can implement this uh, use swap operation by this U lookup, C toggle and U lookup which C toggle is nothing but just conditional on a particular value. So this entire thing can be again done in order log n time because uh, all, each of these operations just take order log n time. So, and uh, yeah, uh, then 
I will discuss the simulation process. So here, what we do is, again, we are back to the original model where we have uh, uh, C, the circuit as from C1 to CD, and it is computing some relation F. Now for, uh, we want to construct a new compressed circuit, which does the same, like which evaluates the same function, but the time is not too much blown up and the space constraint is much lesser. This is the requirement that we want. So for every instruction here, which is not a rag gate, we just do the same thing in this circuit, okay? Which means the number of work qubits is going to be at least this much for us. Now for, all, and the, the, so that's the easy part. For the next part, yeah, for each of these instruction that was indeed a rag gate, we have shown that we can actually use the U swap operation and that we will do uh, instead of the rag gates. In this way, what we have done is we start with an all zero state, right? In, in both of the settings, we start with an all zero state. For every state here, we have an isomorphism to a state here. And the functionality is still going to be the same at every step. So we end up getting a new circuit, which uses much less memory, because now this M dash is going to be just the size of this quantum radix tree, which is not going to, which is not, which is going to be just M log M instead of capital M. And the, the, this additional W dash that comes is because of this rag operation. We need sometimes ancilla to, uh, you know, do an operation uh, reversibly. So it is, it is to account for that, that we use this. And to informally uh, state the theorem, uh, if you have any M sparse quantum algorithm, that uses time t and n qubits, we can simulate that in almost the same time using m log m qubits, which is a big improvement when we look at when m is polynomial in n. And uh, like, yes, the reason all this even came up for us is because of the applications that I'm going to discuss. Now, um, um, I'm not going to discuss all the applications, but I'm going to discuss one of them, which has the same flavor for all the rest. So uh, we can use our these main theorem to simplify actually presentation of three results. Uh, that is like Ambani's quantum walk algorithm for solving element distinctness. It is another one is Aronson et al. Et al.'s quantum algorithm for closest pair problem. And uh, third one is uh, actually our own paper which gave, uh, you know, which led to this result actually on fine grain complexity via quantum work. Let me get into the detail of how this can be, this technique can be actually applied. Now, uh, uh, Ambinus, like in 2004, gave an interesting quantum work algorithm for solving this k element distinctness problem. For this k element, it is a simple problem. We have a list of n integers in some uh, domain. And all we want to know if there are k elements that are equal. That is that is the k problem. Now this um, this algorithm has like the the a minus game this algorithm has a quantum query complexity of this order m bar k by k plus one. And he also gave a method to make this query algorithm time efficient. And to do that, he used some very complicated data structures that are based on hash, hash tables and skip lists, and which was also like not error free. It uses uh, uh, some uh, family of hash function that induces error. So now, but we we noticed that we could actually solve this this k element distinctness problem in a much simpler data structure, but by blowing up the size for a bit. Now let me look at the data structure. Now, um, okay, one of the assumptions that uh, these algorithms allow you to make is that all the inputs to your k element distinctness problem are bound, are in some n power p range, like some polynomial sets, uh, like order uh, log n qubits, let's uh, basically. So now imagine you have this prefix tree data structure again. Now, in this data structure, 
you uh, whenever you have an input xi which is uh, uh, like uh, your input to the k element distinctness problem you go to that particular cell xi you just toggle that one and corresponding to that you have like uh, another bit vector that just checks what was the index this xi came from because remember in element distinctness you're going to check if there are k indices that have the same value so if any of my blocks like this have k ones in it then i'm done then i know that okay i have a solution to this element distinctness problem so now how do you how do you uh, ensure that the solution is uh, reflected on the root node you like the moment this count of any of this value becomes at least k this flag becomes one and the parent and if a child flag is one then the parent flag becomes one and goes you go on up to the root node so in log n step you can actually uh, uh, like you know insert an element or delete an element or see if an element exists and by just looking at the flag value on this root node you can see if you have a solution to your k element distinctness problem or not but the uh, now this doesn't have error this is a uh, what to say unique representation of a set it has history independent property it has all these property that this uh, a minus data structures required for the algorithm to work but the sad part is it uses a lot of memory right we are using like n cube memory here that is under the promise that my inputs come from minus n cube to n cube we are ending up using another additional n memory here so in total we are using like n power 4 memory which is not desirable given that we can't even make you no know, 70 qubits stable right so then yeah clearly we can use this uh, walk algorithm so our, what we propose is yes think of these data structures think of an algorithm and then use our theorem as a black box to simplify this algorithm into a compressed form and um, so a minus walk algorithm actually stores this set as like uh, it's it stores these r size sets in these data structures so we now know that oh using a minus algorithms on this data structure we will create a new algorithm which is very bad on the memory but is guaranteed to be r sparse and then you use the theorem in a black box way and you we conclude this result so this also shows that the uh, same algorithm uh, same complexity we have another simpler algorithm uh, yeah to conclude uh, by, we also do this for some other problem this is called closest pair problem which has a similar flavor it also uses quantum work uses some smart data structure but we use again prefix some tree data structure smartly like their smart techniques but our prefix tree and we combine this thing uh, and we do the same thing for our own paper on fine grain complexity. So yeah, to conclude, uh, theorem can be used in this black box way to simplify presentation of several papers. We are still looking for candidates that uh, we can help solve, you know, upfront, not like you know, simplify any result, but actually solve something new. Um, broadly speaking, if we have a space efficient, uh, like. Uh, Okay, we can always construct a space inefficient algorithm using these prefix tree kind of thing and use our black box theorem to sparsify them. Oh, sorry, to compress them. And uh, um, yeah, this work will appear in the proceedings of TQC this year. And uh, to access the full paper, you can just check out archives on this number. Okay, thank you for your attention. Yeah, there is this notion of com the compressed R technique, like for the quantum random oracle. Have you seen if yeah, somehow Zandri, yeah, yeah, this type of Zandri things? Have you seen uh, if your technique can improve something there? No, I, I like I know that it worked on some random hash functions. Yeah. Uh, so I, we also know that like we can use same this classical family of hash function mm -hmm. and also do that, mm -hmm. but that is going to induce error. Mm -hmm. so, but uh, this technique. Um, 
doesn't induce error because of the hashing thing. Mm -hmm. But there is another uh, reason why there will be little error. That is like whenever you're creating this radix tree, right? Mm -hmm. And you're having this prefix sum tree. Mm -hmm. To insert any new element, you first need to know what all places are empty in the prefix tree mm -hmm. so that you can insert in that in superposition. Mm -hmm. And for that, you need to create uniform superposition of one to k for any k. Mm -hmm. And there you will have a little error because we in don't in have. In our case, so no. In, in, in our case or in our case? Uh, in our case. Okay. Yeah. In their case, they don't need to do this uniform superposition thing, mm -hmm. but they have to use hashing techniques because mm -hmm. otherwise, how are you going to compress? No, but the question is, can you use your data structure to improve their, like the compressed Oracle, like to have faster or I don't know? No, I haven't checked uh, okay. Uh, okay. that thing nice. yet. I did look at it little only to see. Mm -hmm. uh, I think there is no time uh, complexity in their There's a great complexity. No. But if there's no time complexity, why do you need to compress it to start with? Like that, there is something so that you want to minimize. Right? So you can speak about the Zonry paper. Okay, yeah. I think there is no compression at all in that part. So that uh, more uh, framework but the, is not. In fact, if you don't care about time complexity, you will always know you can compress. I think. Yeah, you say uh, this is the unitary, and that's it. No, but as yeah. far as I understand, this the compressor oracle is the idea is that okay. In cryptography, you want to do, to do a reduction. So if you have something efficient, some, sometimes you want to simulate it, right? And for the simulation, you need to, but uh, I'm not sure we can see it offline either. Okay. I will have to check. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it improves their thing. Other questions? Yeah. What is this closest pair for me? Oh, so the closest pair problem is a uh, computational geometry problem. You have a list of n points and um, in some dimension rd, okay? and you want to know the, like you want to output the pair that is closest to each other. In Euclidean distance. In Euclidean okay. distance, yes. I think it can, like, you can define this in under any distance measure, but we usually we care about the Euclidean distance. So for, um, mm, for this problem with, oh yeah, so the algorithm that we give is a constant dimension case and you can actually use quantum walk algorithm again and uh, like in, in the same way that you do for element distinctness or uh, tree sum or any of these problems and you can get a query algorithm for n part two by three. So, so what are you querying here? Where the point is, like a binary description of? Yeah, so here, yeah, you can, like, because you have limited space anyways to store your point, you can discretize it. You can just sure. imagine that they are uh, in some LD. Uh, yeah, you basically query the point, the, the what is the value of this point. And yeah, to make the algorithm time efficient, we could again use prefix tree. So for every point, uh, so there's something, one more layer that happens. You also discretize the space. Like there's something else that is there in the paper. I can call I this. Uh, and so what is the time to let's inform also? Also, O tilde n bar. Oh. So, but uh, this was already proven. Right? Sure. For answer, we just simplified it. Sure. Yes. Uh, yes. Um, so, um, okay, so I have probably two, two questions. Um, so first, I'm very happy you did this work because now I can use it as a blackboard. Mm -hmm. It was always a mess for yeah. time efficiency, how you deal with that. So. And coming back to, uh, at some point, you compare to the work of uh, several people in 2013, uh, 2013, yes, of Stacy and others. Yeah, yeah. So I'm just trying to see what is the difference. So suppose oh. they, is that, they have a solution which was not good enough for some reasons? No, so, so, um, uh, okay. The quantum radix tree idea mm -hmm. was from Stacey, the, yeah. the 2013 thing. So they actually talk about this classical radix tree, but uh, using mm -hmm. over all these memory representations, yes. exactly what we define. But what they don't clearly talk about is how are you going to do any of these data structure operation on the because maybe they didn't need uh, yeah uh, like they 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 gloss over it but they don't actually uh, okay. define things yeah, properly okay. so we just clear. Also, it looks like uh, 
imagine for some reason my memory is classical. Yeah. And I have a quantum algorithm that access to a classical memory. For some reason, the, mem the memory is always classical. Yeah. Looks like somehow you quantize it because you need yes. these things. So I don't know how, how much interesting in this, but. You're not sure of what? How much interesting is my question? So yeah. she's coming. So is that, uh, do you really need to quantize? I mean, is there a noble theorem if you don't quantize? Well, yeah, we need to see the, the whole. I see uh, why you need it. Yeah, but yeah. Okay. Can you prove that mathematically you need oh, to. That way. Assuming, uh, again, the memory is classical. Uh, because classically, of course, uh, you don't quantize. Uh, but then you have an, uh, a memory which is uh, historic. It's not unique, uh, dependent on the history. Yeah, see, the, the so thing is. You ask more, that's why, why you need. So maybe. Yeah. If I understand your question correctly, uh, in classical algorithms, we don't need this memory representation to be unique. Yeah, yeah. because we don't have this con concept yeah. of interference. Like, see, basically what happens <clears throat> is in the quantum algorithms, whenever the resultant state uh, goes to the same set S, we want the amplitude to collect or interference to happen. Now in the classical setting, so we don't have that concept. So my, yeah. uh, okay. so uh, my question now yeah. assumes that uh, when the memory is classical, yeah. but, the quantum, uh, but the algorithm is quantum. Quantum, yeah, okay. So there is a small register huh, that can be, the workspace can be quantum, right? Okay. So for that, one question. So, okay, so there are two registers. There is yeah. a, the RAM register, and then there is a workspace, right? Mm -hmm. No, it's a W. There is a W. Yeah, yeah. So this one is quantum. Okay, but assume that the memory, the, what you do, yeah. is classical for some reason. Now, how do you? Why? Can, uh, what if you entangle to this register? How do you Maybe address? Not entangle. I don't know. <laughs> no, I mean for some. Okay, it's a it's a math question. So it's and then if you apply your technique, yeah. then the memory become quantum. Because you need to do the superposition of a whole. Uh... My friend, like it will be quantum even if they, she didn't know the superposition she managed to do it because the superposition is just for a fixed element in the quotation base, as far as I understand. For that one, they need a superposition. And on top of that, you have the logical gate, right? The logical state. Yes. Yeah, so, you know. mm -hmm. His point was that, uh, you know, usually when you have a classical memory, you can just take uh, all the, the reads that you needed. Uh, at first, mm -hmm. and then use it, but that takes memory, you know, mm -hmm. and then somehow you don't want to use this quantum memory for nothing during the whole computation. So you have these classical memories uh, at your disposal, and then maybe your question is that yeah. Yeah, if you have just this classical memory and you want to take reads at it at some point, but you know, not store it in a quantum way because you have limited memory, is this kind of uh, is this kind of approach uh, feasible? But so I try to make sense again. Yeah, so, so basically, I want to remove this superposition of all uh, possible. Uh, this. So I try to make sense of this. So you know, you can imagine you know there's this notion of uh, quantum classical RAM. So this is basically this. So it, let, let's say you have a big RAM, which is basically uh, big data, and you have your algorithm working with this RAM. So maybe sometime you update uh, your RAM, whatever. Can you maybe it doesn't make sense, it's possible, but just try to understand mathematically if there is a way to remove the superposition of all possible. I don't know, maybe it doesn't make sense. I, so I, don't, don't, know. Know. I don't know. So there's one restriction that you can have in an algorithm, which is that you're, you're, you just read out of the memory, so you never toggle a bit depending on you know, yeah. your state of the quantum circuit. And then in some sense, you're always in a product state with the, with, with the memory and the memory kind. And then I don't think that you need the swap of of history is because you're always in a product state. That's true. That's true. That's true. Yeah. So how if you're ready to do a partial measurements or stuff like that, you could also write stuff in the memory at some point, you know, if you're in some very special state, then you make uh, this kind of partial measurements. Yes. Just stuff with classical memory. So with this kind of stuff, maybe you, you can have a, a classical memory and talk to it with reads and writes during the, your whole computation, you know, which you have a very limited quantum reads. So this kind of setting like, is, uh, is actually useful, but uh, I, I, I don't see how this approach uh, relates to that, because, because actually this approach is 
whole like the whole point is to make a quantum memory go into a smaller quantum one. So maybe just the classical approach would work for uh, what you have in mind. Mm -hmm. uh, so we don't see this context. If you are untangled, then yeah. Because from what I, I understand, you know, in, in your time complexity, in the end, you say it goes from t to you, know, you go uh, tilde of t, but but in fact, it's only the uh, the RAG operations that uh, that that that, exactly. that is building. Yeah. So, like if if you if you take the time um, the time complexity is something like uh, T plus A, where T are the operations uh -huh. and you know, A are the access. It's just T plus uh, A uh, log A, in fact, yeah. uh, or you know A log of something. Uh, yeah. Uh, but the, the, thing, the problem is yeah. this uh, simulation of this RAG operation. The use swap that we interchange yeah. it with yeah. that also uses rags in its. Uh, uh, like working. Uh, so, so what, what do you mean? Like in your simulation is not just we replace rag by swap. Yeah, it is. So yeah. yes, I replace rag by mm -hmm. swap. Yeah. But the complexity of this U swap, yeah. which has like O till uh, like O uh, order M log uh, M uh, operations. Mm -hmm. Sorry, order uh, log yeah. M operations. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, swap, yeah. yeah. They also use like that is counting the rag operations in that also. Oh yeah. So, so yeah. yeah. So you're making more rag operations. Yeah. 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 My mind was just that uh, you know it's not exactly a, a log n increase over the whole stuff. It's just a very local log n increase. So yeah, yeah. 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 Very, yes. very often. It's actually even more efficient than what, what we could think uh, when looking at the, uh, the simulation. Like a, yes. Yes. Uh, yeah. Actually, like you're right. It comes more as an additive term on the number of rag gates that we uh, use mm -hmm. rather than mm -hmm. on a product. The outside. Mm -hmm.